Hello, and this video uh, is one of two on the alveolar gas equation. This video is looking at the derivation, um, and the next one will look at the clinical application for the alveolar gas equation. Now, knowledge of the derivation is definitely not required for the exam, but I think awareness of where the terms come from is a useful way to get a better understanding of, of the equation and will hopefully lead into uh, some of the application. And it's worth pausing at this point to say, why are we bothering with all of this? And fundamentally, the answer is that we need to try and work out what P big AO2 is, and that's the oxygen partial pressure within the alveoli. Now, this is a number that we can't directly measure, um, and yet it's a really important number because it, it's a large part of what determines the extent to which oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. So if we can't directly measure it, then we need to find some other stuff that we can directly measure. And the reason that the um, derivation of the alveolar gas equation is quite convoluted is simply because we need to find some other variables that we can measure. Um, so the derivation in itself is not something that's particularly elegant, um, but it ends up with a situation where we've got a number that we want to know but we can't measure, and then that is determined by a series of other parameters which we can directly measure. And there's essentially four key steps to the derivation. Uh, the first of which is a firm understanding of Dalton's law and what that tells us and some terms that that allows us to generate. We then look at conservation of mass for CO2. So essentially say what's produced by the body must be coming out the lungs at steady state. And that gives us some terms and a slight sidebar into the alveolar ventilation equation. We do the same thing and make some very similar arguments for oxygen. And then we bring it all together with a bit of maths at the end. We now go on to look at Dalton's law, uh, and Dalton's law states that the total pressure of a mixture of gases equals the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases. And what does he actually mean by that? Well, if we've got a container at a given pressure of a mixture of gases, so it has a total pressure, which we'll call P tot, that total pressure is the same as if we added up the individual components uh, of those gases. So if we've got each gas on its own at a given partial pressure, so that'll be P1, we've got this gas on its own and this gas on its own, and then we've combined them into this mixture of gases here, then the pressure in this container is the same as the sum of these three pressures. And to put that mathematically, we can say that P tot this is a this sigma is a summation sign, uh, and that simply means over all of the individual uh, small pressures, so P1 plus P2, for however many gases you have, if you add them all up, that will be the same as the total pressure of the mixture of the gases. And we can apply Dalton's law to atmospheric pressure because atmospheric pressure is, is from a contribution of the constituent parts of the atmosphere, so namely nitrogen, oxygen, CO2 uh, and water vapour. There will be some very small contributions from, from the minor gases like helium, uh, xenon, etc., um, and for completion of Dalton's law, uh, we would need to include those. But for practical purposes, uh, they're the only four gases that we need to consider, uh, and they are the individual partial pressures making up total atmospheric pressure. And another important consequence of Dalton's law is if we recognise that the total pressure is made up of the constituent partial pressures, then we can also say that the partial pressure of any particular gas in the mixture it's just the total pressure of all the mixture times by the fraction with which that gas makes up the mixture. So if we've got a, uh, a gas which makes up 50% of a mixture of gases, um, then the partial pressure of that gas will be 50% of the total pressure. Likewise, if it's 25% of the mixture, it'll make up 25% of the total pressure. And we can apply this to our alveoli, so coming back to some real-world physiology, and we can say that the uh, partial pressure of oxygen within the alveoli will be the fraction of oxygen as a, as a fraction of the other gases within the alveoli times by the total uh, alveolar pressure. And a way to, uh, we can rearrange that to give us this term here where the, the fraction of oxygen within the alveoli equals the partial pressure of oxygen within the alveoli divided by the total alveolar pressure. And this term here forms an important part of our derivation. And next we look at conservation of mass for CO2 and we make the assumption that under steady state conditions the rate of production of CO2 by the body is equal to the rate of CO2 removal. And we can term that as a V dot CO2 which is the defined as the rate of production and we'll talk about that in a second is equal to the 
minute ventilation, the alveolar ventilation, multiplied by uh, the fraction of CO2 within alveolar gas. So how much gas is shifting from the alveoli multiplied by what proportion of that gas uh, is CO2. And then just to go on to explain this V dot CO2 term, the dot actually means uh, to differentiate with respect to time and the V is volume. So what we're doing is we're seeing what change in volume occurs over a given time period. So if we were to plot this graph, we'd have a change in volume over a change in time. Well, that's actually the same as saying what's the flow rate, just as an aside to explain this term. And now we invoke Dalton's law again, and we make exactly the same argument we made for oxygen, where the um, alveolar fraction of oxygen was equal to the partial pressure of oxygen within the alveoli divided by the total alveolar pressure. And we use exactly uh, uh, the analogous term for CO2. So now we can substitute this term in for the partial pressure of CO2 within the alveoli divided by total alveolar pressure. We then assume that because CO2 rapidly diffuses uh, across the alveoli, that the partial pressure of CO2 within the alveoli gas is equal to the partial pressure of CO2 within the pulmonary capillaries, i.e. that there's no AA gradient for CO2. We can then rearrange this term uh, to get P small a CO2 on its own, and that gives us the alveolar ventilation equation. And the alveolar ventilation equation shows us that there's an inverse relationship between arterial CO2 tension and alveolar ventilation. And if we were to plot that on a graph, we would see that there's this um, inverse relationship where as we increase our alveolar ventilation, we see a decrease in arterial CO2. And next we look at conservation of mass for oxygen, and we say that at steady state, the rate of oxygen uptake into the lungs uh, is equal to the rate of oxygen consumption by the body. Now the rate of oxygen entry into the lungs is just the difference between the rate of oxygen being inhaled and the rate of oxygen being exhaled. And that's equal to this term here, V dot O2, which by definition is the rate of O2 consumption. Now looking at these specific terms, we can say that the amount of oxygen inhaled uh, is equal to the alveolar ventilation multiplied by the fraction of oxygen in that inspired gas. Now, there's an important caveat here. The, uh, the, the gas inhaled initially from, from the atmosphere is, is not humidified. But as you inhale it in the upper airways, it becomes fully humidified. And therefore, you need a correction factor that accounts for the addition of water vapour within that gas. So there'll be a proportionate reduction in the fraction of oxygen as a consequence of humidification. And that's an important point to make. That's the O2 inhaled bit taken care of. Um, the O2 exhaled bit um, is simply the alveolar ventilation multiplied by the fraction of oxygen within the alveoli. We next invoke the concept of the respiratory quotient, uh, which is defined as the rate of CO2 production divided by the rate of oxygen consumption. So V dot CO2 divided by um, V dot O2. Um, the value of the respiratory quotient is dependent on dietary intake. It's uh, usually quoted as one for carbohydrates, uh, but for a mixed West, Western diet, uh, 0 0.8. We'll talk more about the respiratory quotient in the next video. If we rearrange this, uh, then we can say that V dot O2 uh, is equal to uh, V dot CO2 divided by the respiratory quotient, and then we can substitute this term in. And we can start to bring this together now. So remembering that from our conservation of uh, mass for oxygen um, and the respiratory quotient argument, we've got this term here. And from our conservation of mass for CO2 and Dalton's law, we have this term here. Well, we can substitute in, uh, we've got a, a V dot CO2 and a V dot CO2. So we can substitute this term in here into the top equation and then start our derivation. And substitution of that term gives us this phrase here. Uh, we can then factorise for V dot A, as that's common throughout, which gives us this term here. And then we can see that these terms will cancel on both sides of the equation. And that leaves us with this term here. We then recall from Dalton's law that uh, the fractional concentration of oxygen within the alveoli is equal to the partial pressure of oxygen within the alveoli divided by alveolar total pressure. And exactly the same argument can be made for CO2. Therefore, this term here and this term here can be substituted for this phrase and this phrase respectively. And that leaves us with 
this equation. We then multiply by PA and then rearrange to get PaO2 as our primary term. OK, nearly there. We then need to recall the full um, term for FiO2 star, and that was the FiO2, so the fraction of inspired oxygen, corrected for the addition of water vapour upon humidification. So if we put that full term in, we get this phrase here. Um, and then we can recognise that the average alveolar partial pressure will equal atmospheric pressure. So this term and this term can cancel each other. The final assumption is that uh, there's no AA gradient for CO2, as we'd previously discussed, um, which means that we can convert this alveolar partial pressure of CO2 into an arterial partial pressure of CO2. And that final assumption gives us the alveolar gas equation. The clinical implications of this um, and its application uh, will be discussed in the next video. So just to recap, we started with uh, the definition of Dalton's law uh, and its implications on alveolar gases. We looked at conservation of mass for CO2 uh, and went into the alveolar ventilation equation. We made some similar arguments for the conservation of mass for O2 uh, and also described why we needed to correct for humidification in the upper airways. And then we put it all together with some maths to come up with the final alveolar gas equation. Thanks very much for listening. I hope that was helpful.